Please turn to Revelation chapter 1. Now, I can't do more tonight than just give a slight introduction to the book. Another thing, this is the book I wrote in 1974. No, 1973. There's a new world coming. It's a paragraph-by-paragraph analysis of the book of Revelation. Now, in my lessons here, I'll go beyond what I've written that far back. But it still is very relevant, and it'll operate as a kind of a study guide for you. So try to get a copy of this soon if you're going to go through this, because I think it'll really help. All right, Revelation. First thing I want to address is the date of when this book was written. It's very important to know when the book of Revelation was written. And most people are shocked when they find out. You see, how many have heard of this false movement that's in the church today called the Dominionist or the Kingdom Now? Let me see your hands. How many have heard of that? Okay. Well, not too many, but a few. Many may have heard of it and not even know you were hearing it. But this is a group that tries to say, well, they don't try, they do say, that God is finished with Israel as a nation. And their contention is the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD, and it's not about the second coming at all. It's about the coming, pouring out of God's wrath on his enemy, Israel. So they say this book is about the destruction of Israel. Now, the whole argument goes up in smoke if we can establish that this book was written even one day after 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and scattered the Jewish people the four winds. Okay? So it's important to learn when was this book written? All right, I've got some interesting things for you. First of all, we know that this must have been written at a late date and after 70 AD, and the reason is because the temple is not referred to as standing. It is referred, the temple, when mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, it's talking about building it shortly before the return of Christ, but is not mentioned as standing or mentioned as a factor anywhere in this book. Now, if it was talking about the destruction of Israel, it certainly would have talked about the destruction of the temple, but it doesn't. But we have a lot of witness from church history. Now, we have the testimony of Irenaeus, who lived between 120 and 202 A.D., 120, 202 A.D. Now, that's very close to biblical times. Now, here's why his testimony is important. Irenaeus was a great church leader, and he was personally discipled by Polycarp. You ever heard of Polycarp? Okay. Polycarp lived from A.D. 70 to A.D. 155. And guess who personally discipled Polycarp? The Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. He was personally, and this is witnessed to by all kinds of corollary extra-biblical history. And, you know, there, there's a lot of church history that's very reliable. And it's, it's exciting to study it. But here's the thing. This is what Irenaeus said, and he would have said this sometime around 160 A.D., which would have not been very far after the facts. He said, and I quote, We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist. Now, that's fancy words for saying we're not going to try to name the Antichrist. Now, why? He goes on to say, 
For if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in the present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. Who was that? John, all right. For that was not very long, not a very long time since, but almost in our day. In other words, he's saying when John wrote this, it was almost in our time. And he says, toward the end of Emperor Caesar Domitian's reign, end quote. All right, now that nails it. In other words, he's saying that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation near the end of the reign of Caesar Domitian. Now we know absolutely when he reigned. And we also know that according to the witness of the church of Ephesus, that Domitian sent an edict all through the Roman Empire to stamp out the Christian sect. In other words, stop them from spreading because they were spreading too fast. He didn't like it, and he wanted it. He wanted all evangelism and all spreading of Christianity stamped out. So, this is why it's reported that it was under the reign of And by the way, he was the only Caesar that sent an edict out to all of the empire to imprison those who were spreading the gospel. So this was the edict that was sent to to Ephesus, among all of the other places in the Roman Empire, that caused the governor of Ephesus to seek to stop the apostle John from preaching the gospel. Uh, This is always inspiring to me. Let's look at something in Revelation here. I believe it's Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Yes, where he says, this is John. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You see, when the edict got to Ephesus, John was so powerful. And by the way, at this time, he would have been over 80 years old. He was so powerful, he was such a tiger for Christ, they couldn't shut him up. They threatened him, they did everything, but they couldn't shut him up. And the governor, was the Roman governor was wise enough to know that if he made a martyr out of him, he would spread it even more. So he got this plan to ship him off to the worst penal island in the Roman Empire. Patmos was where they sent the worst criminals. And they would just dump them there. And so he sent him to the island of Patmos because he was sure that he would die. And that would just be the end of it. He wouldn't become some martyr or anything. No one would really know what happened. they just think he went to Patmos. And that he was in this, this island with these vicious criminals. And so off they sent him to the island of Patmos. Now, I've been there many times. By the way, today it's a beautiful island. But then Alcatraz would look like paradise compared to this island. There was no way to swim ashore from there. It sits out by itself. But there was one thing they didn't count on. They dumped this old man off there, all these vicious criminals. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he started leading one after another to faith in Christ. So that by the time, <laughs> within a month or so, he had people taking care of him, out, out scrounging up food for him, defending him. They wouldn't let anybody hurt him. You know what that is? Romans eight twenty eight. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to purpose. But here was this old tiger at over 80. And 
He didn't care what they told him. He would not stop witnessing for Jesus Christ. Now, if you tell someone they need forgiveness, they need to enter a new life, they need to receive the gift of pardon that Jesus Christ died to give them, what's the worst that's going to happen to you? A little bit of embarrassment, which you shouldn't get anyway. Because if someone rejects what you say, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. I had to get that straight when I first joined Campus Crusade for Christ because I didn't like to be rejected. And so, <laughs> in fact, I, I had to learn, I, I really had to learn a lot of lessons the hard way. I remember one time I was teaching a class in the professor from Perkins Theological Seminary, that's part of SMU, Southern Methodist University, where I was working for Campus Crusade while I was still going to seminary. I remember him standing up and saying, telling me basically I was stupid and that all of these things were wrong.